2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 15. 2 Timothy 3, 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation, through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Which are able to make thee wise through faith which is in Christ Jesus. We said that the skillfulness, which is the Sophia or the Sophizo, is in the subject of salvation, which is actually how the books of the Old Testament are to be read. Also, we have been looking at the terms sozo, soteria, two critical words in this subject, and of course, ayomai, the word used for healing. And primarily, by saying salvation through faith in Christ, here Brother Paul emphasizes on the sota, the sota. So our focus should never be on the condition of sin at the detriment or at the absence or at the independence of salvation. In this instance, the sota, the one who does it. Look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. That's what the angel said. He shall sozo hamatia. Jesus said remission of sins for many in Matthew 26 28 Aphesis hamatia the angel said sozo hamatia Jesus said aphesis hamatia the sozo preserves the sozo heals protects that's the sozo to preserve to heal to protect aphesis is to take away from to take away from, to prevent from harm and injury. Now we were in First Peter chapter 2 verse 24 a few days ago. First Peter 2 24 where we started looking at the object of the healing. The two key words there are the word healed, healed, ayomai, and bore, he bore, which is what he carried. Obviously he's referring to the sufferings of Christ that he mentioned in that same first Peter chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Read for me first Peter chapter 1 verse 10 and 11. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Of the grace that should come unto you. Next verse. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. It testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. And of which soteria, quoting Peter, quoting from the Old Testament books, who prophesied of the grace. Grace is a gift, something given without condition. And he says they were searching what manner of time the spirit of Christ they testified when he testified of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that will follow. The word suffering already informs us is what Jesus allowed. The sufferings of Christ. And then he says the glory afterwards. So he teaches salvation from the point of Christ's suffering. And then the glory after. Of course, the glory can be the glory of Christ independent of those he saved. The glory can be the glory of Christ independent of those he saved. That will be those he saved or that will be those he saved will be the glory of his sufferings. So it's not like a mentality of Jesus being on a throne. Then he vacated the throne, went on sabbatical, died and went, went back to be in full time operation. No, there's actually glory in what he has done. So salvation, therefore, will be to look at the sufferings. What exactly what was his sufferings? We have seen that his suffering was a blow in taking away from existence. In taking away from existence. We've also seen that his suffering was a change that happened to him. A change that happened to him. We've also seen that his suffering definitely was a death. Was a death. But the death was not just the fact that he died physically. His suffering was a blow on his person that he bore the sins. 
not actually in his physical body, but the fact that he actually bore it on himself. His whole being became that object of man's inadequacy. His entire being became the object of that man's inadequacy. So when he says he became poor in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. When he says that, he became poor, that we might be rich. That is, he became destitute, spiritually speaking. And that's what happened to Jesus when he died. So the soteria, therefore, is obviously the teaching of salvation, in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 10 to 12 and 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 24 the teaching of salvation which has now become our healing by his stripes bolops we are healed i am i restored verse 25 is our focus again 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25 read for me JP 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25 for you were as sheep going astray but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your soul. We have now returned. He calls him the shepherd, the pastor, the bishop, the episcopos of our lives. He is the bishop of our lives. So it takes responsibility. And that's the essence. In Acts 20, 28, see the way Dr. Luke communicated those same, thought, same thoughts. Read for me. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. To feed the church of God which he had purchased. He had purchased. How? With his own blood. The word feed the flock there, he says, the elders, he has made you overseers. So the word bishop there, he becomes the one who is overseeing our lives. The bishop, the shepherd, and the bishop of our souls. The overseer of our lives. Now, that's a relationship. That's a relationship. You will find that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 2. The word bishop, 1 Timothy 3, 2. Titus chapter 1, verse 7. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. The word bishop. Now, let's go back to that word body. Bore it on his own, in his own body. You should know I was implying that we shouldn't look at the word body from the perspective of a physical body. What about his organs, his heart, his liver, his kidneys? That's not the essence of that word soma, body soma. The word body there refers to, you know, by using the word otos, if you remember otos, I gave you that word earlier, otos, then soma is referring to his pressing, his pressing. Look at Colossians chapter 2 verse 10. The word somaticus. Somaticus. Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power. We are complete in him which is the head. The somaticus. Okay. Now it is related to soma. Bodily. In him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead. Bodily. Bodily. Please pay attention. So he's talking about him, you know, personally. Colossians 3.15. Colossians chapter 3 verse number 15. Please pay attention. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. In one body, one person, one unit, one constituent. Ephesians 2.16 Ephesians chapter 2 verse number 16 And that he might, might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. One body. So the word body is not just the physical body of a man, but all that a man represents. Again, by mentioning that his life was taken by Isaiah, obviously, his life was not just the physical life that was being described, but his human life, and the human life is not just physical, but spiritual and physical. Look at that First Peter chapter 1 verse 11. Let's follow through the narrative. First Peter chapter 1 verse 11. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, 
when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. It testified beforehand prose. Beforehand, the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. So he spoke about the sufferings of Christ. First Peter 2.24. 1 Peter 2.24. Follow the narrative. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. By whose stripes he bore our sins on himself. So to know whether he was just referring to a physical life or in the sense whether his body, you know, his body being expired on earth or not, is to read further because he described that suffering much later. First Peter 3.18. First Peter chapter 3 verse number 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened in the Spirit. Tip, pay attention to that Christ once, once. If your Bible was mine, I will underline that once, or I will write it out in bold letters. Once. There is the word hapax. Hapax. Used 11 times. Hapax. A-H-A-P-A-X. Used 11 times. It is a combination of a very difficult word. Hapax has the word alpha. Now you know alpha in the Greek is negative. Okay, Alpha. Anytime you see alpha in the Greek is negative. And it has alpha. So when you say once, it means not something. It's like saying not again. Not again. So Christ suffered not again that is he has done it it will not be required anymore he has done it it won't be required anymore the word wants so it's not the time or the fact that the one has as a number but it's the emphasis on what he has done the writer of hebrews applies that same word a number of times hebrews chapter 6 verse number 4 hebrews chapter 6 verse number 4 for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Have tasted of the heavenly gift once. Once enlightened. Hebrews 9, 7. Hebrews 9, 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. Once every year. And you observe that anywhere the word once was mentioned by the writer of Hebrews, it was finality. Once every year. But putting every year, it means it won't go beyond that time of the year. Hebrews 9, 26 and 27. Pay attention to once. 26 and 27. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. But now once. Next verse. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Once, once. Hebrews 10, 2. The writer of Hebrews used that word once a lot. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Once purged. Hebrews 10, 26. Hebrews 10, 26. The word hapax. For if we sin willfully after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. There remaineth no more sacrifice. No more is the word once. Is the word hapax. No more. Hebrews 12, 27. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 27. And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Yet once more. So go on to First Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3. But hold on when you get to First Peter. What has he done? So he refers to something that happened once, never to happen again. Was he referring to the physical death of Jesus? Well, we will see that in a moment. That was incorporated, but it's much heavier than the physical death of Jesus. It's incorporated, but much more heavier. 
He says in First Peter three eighteen. Put it up again, First Peter three eighteen. Read for me. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He is that he may bring us to God. Oh, that language. That he might, it's not like he will drag us, drag us to God. It's language. It's not like he will bring us. It's the word prosago. Prosago, P-R-O-S-A-G-O, prosago. It means to create access. That he may bring us to God, prosago is the word. It means to create access. So what he has done is not to drag you, but to create access. We are talking about relationship. To create access, and you will see the use of that word, in Luke chapter 9 verse 41, you can read that in your private study at home. But give me Acts 16, 20. Acts chapter 16 verse number 20. He has created access. And brought them to the magistrates saying, These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. And bring them to the magistrates. So there is an act on our part that we might come to God. You will also see it in Acts 27, 27. It means to create access. So by what Jesus has done, we have access to God. Again, what has he done? What he has done is about access. Being put to death in the flesh. Please pay attention here. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. It means made alive. Quicken, the same word in Romans 8:11, the word zoopio in the Greek, Z O O P O I E E A, zoopio. You will see it in John 5:21. John 5:21. Let's read that John 5:21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. The Son quickeneth, makes alive whom he will. John 6.63. John 6.63. It is the Spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So if it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit. So meaning you are quickened by the word that is spoken. They are spirit made alive. Romans 4, 17. Romans chapter 4, verse number 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead. And calleth those things which be not as though they were. Interestingly, the way Peter puts it, he teaches his death. He was put to death in his flesh. Then he is made alive by the Spirit. Watch this. By which he went. He was made alive by the Spirit. Get back again to 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 19 to 22. 1 Peter 3 19 to 22. Made alive by the Spirit. By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Next verse. Which sometime were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. Next verse. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By, by the, the resurrection, resurrection of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. Christ. Then look at 22 now. Let's do it. Who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, Angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Angels and authorities and powers being made subject to this is how he describes him being alive. Look at First Peter now chapter 4 verse 1. First Peter chapter 4 verse 1. For as much then as Christ had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that had suffered in the flesh had ceased from sin. So he is saying that Christ suffered, I'm feeling Ghana now, Christ suffered for us as a man, but in his resurrection, he gives us a spiritual reality. So the suffering is both in the flesh, but much more in his resurrection. He gives us a reality that he has gone into heaven 
and all angels and principalities are subject to him. So notice what it brings to bear here. It brings to bear that there is a quickening and there is a life by the spirit. There is a quickening and there is a life by the spirit. So that life by the spirit is the access we have with God. That life by the spirit is the access that we have with God. So it's not like the road. It's a gift. It's like a gift of access. The resurrection of Jesus gave us a gift of access. As though God beseeching us with that gift. As though God beseeching us in that gift. And then don't forget that he is preaching from Isaiah 53. I hope you remember that. Peter is preaching all of this from Isaiah 53. And all he describes from Isaiah 53 is God dealing with sin in Christ. God dealing with sin in Christ. So again, 1 Peter 2.24. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse number 24. Who his, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Sin is taught as sickness. And from that point, it's taught as sickness. So back to Isaiah 53 verse 1. Pay attention. Isaiah 53 verse number 1. And now, O oh inhabitants. No, they gave you the wrong one, PJ. Now, Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? So a condition is cured by what Christ has done. A condition is cured. But if you don't see it that way, the way you will always be seeing forgiveness will be from a pardon point of view. Meanwhile, it depends on what you were talking about. Because you can see forgiveness from a pardon point of view. You've, you have done wrong. So, what you have done wrong, they won't punish you for it. Pardon. But we have seen that forgiveness is taught as healing. Which isn't about an action that is resolved by pardon. It's more here like filling a space. It's not just pardon, but there is a space that is filled. That's why the word healing is used by Isaiah and Peter to describe the benefit of that resurrection. The word healing. So look at Isaiah chapter 53. Where we just read right now. You know or you can write it down and, and, and read at home. But you know we read earlier the other day. John 12 38. Read for me John 12 38. John 12 38. John not Jonah. Who is on that computer? John 12 38. That the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake. Lord, who hath believed our report? And to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? And to whom is the arm of the Lord, or to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Romans 10, 16. Romans chapter 10, verse 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah saith, Lord, who has believed our report? Who has believed our report? So both Romans and John are quoting from where? Isaiah 53. And Peter is quoting from where? Isaiah. So you see that Isaiah and David are the two quoted Old Testament prophets in the, in the New Testament. They are the most quoted, both by Jesus and by the apostles. Those are two books to pay attention to. Now, stay with me here. Who hath believed our report? The word report here is the word Shemua. Shemua. Who has believed our Shemua? S-H-E-M-U-A-H -H in the Hebrew. From the word Shama. Shemua from the word Shama. Jehovah, Jehovah Shama. Huh? Shama. It means news. Shemua. News. Message. Something that is news. Shemua means you are reporting an event, a statement, or an experience. Who has believed our Shemua? The word believed is the word aman. Who has aman our Shemua? Used for Abraham in 
Genesis 15 verse 6. Abraham believed the Lord and it was counted to him for righteousness. So when you find a man and Shemua together, it's a faith action. Something that somebody has done, somebody will do, somebody has said, and you are supposed to rely on. Something that somebody has done, somebody will do, somebody has said that you will rely upon. So by Isaiah's prophecy, they are expected to expect that Christ will die for sin. Go to Romans chapter 10, verse 16 to 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 16 to 17. But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? Next verse. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Oh my goodness. So then, the word cometh is in italics. That means it's not in the original. You can delete it. So then, faith by hearing. Faith by hearing. The word hearing there is faith by what is heard. Is the word ako or Faith ako, a-k-o-e, a, a message. Now the King James Version, faith is by what is heard. Then the second word he used there, he now used rema, rema. Faith by hearing, rema, rema, explaining what he is saying. That hearing is rema. Faith by hearing. What is hearing? Rema. R-H-E-M-A. Rema. Rema Christos. Faith by hearing. Rema Christos. That's the way it is. That is the message of Christ. Faith by hearing the message of Christ, Rema Christos, which is from verse 14. Give me that Romans chapter 10. Let's look at the pretext in verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Without a preacher. So the focus there is not faith for salvation or faith for healing. No. The focus there is believing the gospel. That's the subject of discourse. Believing the gospel. Believing the gospel. You know, I said believing the gospel is only situated when you have heard about Christ. Believing the gospel is only situated when you have heard about Christ. Rema Christos. It's not just anything in the Bible. It has to be about Christ. A man cannot be saved outside of hearing Rema Christos. There can be no salvation. If all you had is principles of success and you answered an altar call, you are a false convert. If all you had was keys to prosperity, and you answer the altar call because you want that prosperity, you are a false brother. No man can be saved without Rema Christos. Specify. Faith by hearing Rema Christos. By hearing the message of Christ. You must hear the message of how can they believe on Christ whom they have not heard. So what they must hear is a Rema Christos. They must hear about a him, a whom. They must hear of a whom. Specific. Teaching good? Specific. There was a him. In fact, from Romans chapter 10, verse 6 and 7, I like the dialogue there, brother Paul was putting forth. Read for me, verse 6 and 7. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down from above. That's right. Or who shall descend into the deep. That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Next. 
But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. The word that will save you is the word we have spoken that has entered into your heart and now is coming out of your mouth. And that word is the word of faith, faith in the Rema Christos. The word of faith which we preach, not the word of fear, the word of faith. The word is nigh you. Jesus doesn't need to rise from the dead anymore. And no dead man need to come back from heaven to tell us the things they saw for us to be saved. You don't need all of that. The word of salvation is not in the sky, neither is it in the grave. It's already available in your mouth through the preaching of the Rema Christos. Teaching good tonight. So, 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 so. That's what he is saying. So the faith is in the hearing of that truth about Jesus. So not just the truth about Jesus' healing ministry. Uh -uh. You, don't, you don't get saved by Jesus is passing this way, this way, this way. Jesus is passing this way. Shout hallelujah. That's not salvation. If he's passing, he means he's passing. Now only in Waka come. <laughs> Not the truth about Jesus, how he calmed the storm. We all shall sweetly obey my will. Peace be still. Peace be still. We all shall sweetly obey my will. Peace, peace, be still. That's not salvation. What you must hear is not the coming of the storm or the healing of sickness. What you must hear is the Rema Christos. To see him as the object of Isaiah 53. To see him as the object of Isaiah 53. He says that faith is the faith from the message of Christ or faith of the message of Christ. What it means is that when a man hears the gospel and he responds to it, the result of responding to the gospel is faith. The result of responding to the gospel is faith. God's word gives the message. Then man hits it. That is faith. God's word gives the message. Then man hits that message. That is faith. So faith is found between what the man did and what God said. Faith is found between what the man did and what God said. So it can be seen as a gift. God's gift in Christ by the message and it can also be seen as the response of the man number one it can be seen as god's gift in christ via the message then number two is man's response to that gift so faith happens as the message is preached and the man has believed as the message is preached and the man has believed there can be faith without the two you independently can't have faith. <laughs> it's not the message without the hearer, nor the hearer without the message. Both are required. So it says, by what has been heard, and by what has been heard, has to be specific. What has been heard has to be specific. It has to locate Christ as the suffering servant to Jews. It has to locate Christ as the suffering servant to Jews. The Jews are probably confused because they dealt with kingdoms while they had kings. From David to his son Solomon. They are used to kingdoms and they are now prophesying a king. And it doesn't make sense to have a king and he will suffer. What kind of kingdom will that be when the king is going to suffer? 
It means the subjects of the kingdom are done for. So Jewish people, it doesn't make sense because they are used to kingdoms. They've had kings who were lavish with affluence and influence. They have had kings. Look at Solomon. Look at the convoy. How many cows were killed in Solomon's house per day? 21,000 cows every day. They are used to affluence as kingdom and kings. And when they prophesied of a coming king, they spoke about his suffering. So Jewish people cannot relate with a king that is supposed to be improvised and decorated with poverty. And when you hear poverty, it's poverty of the spirit and even of the physical. A king without convoy. A king without an army. A king without law enforcement abilities. A suffering servant. But yet he has a kingdom. It doesn't make sense to Jewish people. Suffer. King. And he doesn't stop there. He will die. What a king. How do they grapple that his kingdom is not forever? That kingdom is coming with because he will die. When a king dies, what happens to the kingdom? The kingdom packs up. And that is why he said, it has to be a message of faith. That after all of that, when you hear it and it doesn't make sense, you still believe. <laughs> so Isaiah 53. When Isaiah said, who has believed our report? You can now see why Isaiah had to make that statement. Because it goes contrary to how they were reasoning. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Read again for me. Isaiah 53 verse 1. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who has believed our report? The word there is Zeroah. A display of strength. Z-E-R-O-A. Zeroah. A strength that you now show the arm of the Lord revealed. It's interesting that he's about to reveal the strength of God. Then he talks about suffering. <laughs> he's about to unveil the strength of God. Then he talks about suffering. Can you see it's totally opposite what you could look at those prophets. In one way like having a disjointed view about God. That's why the prophet look like their view of God. They spoke something, but they acted differently, or they acted differently and they spoke some because they too were having a conflict of understanding. They were because it didn't fit into the narrative of the day. You can also see that they were quite precise in the message. In their message of the Christ, they were quite precise. In whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He is going to talk about the power of God. And he now says he will bear our sins. And that power, in his power, he will suffer. So the apostles did not create God in their words. It's again from the words of the prophets. Look at Isaiah 53 verse 2 to 4. Isaiah 53 verse 2 to 4. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. There is, when we tell you Jesus is not beautiful, don't be angry. From prophecy, it was told that in his formation and birth, he will come out ugly. Because he's not here for beauty contest. Number one, he is a king that will suffer. It doesn't make sense with the narrative. The savior of the world should be so handsome that everybody is crushing after him. But now he comes in an ugly form. We are to even identify with him. You have to really believe. Teaching good? It's counter narrative. That's why you need faith to believe. The guy is ugly. The guy is suffering and he calls himself a king. People are dealing with him. He cannot do anything. 
Peter brings a knife to fight. He tells him, stop. If I wanted that kind of operation, my army that will come down, they can't be seen with eyes, but they will see their action. So it's not, it's not about display of power. My kingdom will be, will be acquired in my suffering and death. My kingdom is not going to come by war. It's going to come by death and suffering. That's how my kingdom will be built. Counter narrative. Ugly. No wealth. He's not rich. They have to give him money. They have to give him things. That's why you need faith to believe such a king. Eh? Who has believed our Shemua? You know, some of you are acting like Jews. When we say Jesus is not handsome, you are not, you, you, you are struggling because you are, you are a Jew and you are thinking. <laughs> you still think of the king of England, Buckingham Palace. You go to England and just walk around Buckingham. See the wealth of the kingdom that conquered the whole world at one time. Wealth. That's a kingdom. You go to the kingdom of Swaziland. You see the king owns everything plus everybody in the kingdom. Guy's too rich, too wealthy. He can marry 200 wives in one second. All he needs to do is say, I like that one. I like that one. That's how they'll be following. Then you hear of a king that will suffer. A king that is ugly. No beauty in him. A king that is not rich. Uh -uh. Your mind grapples. It fight. Now, you that has not even been around a kingdom. How much more Jews that kingdom is how they were raised up. You that has not been around a kingdom. All you know is democracy. You are struggling with the concept of a king in, a do in, in his domain. Imagine a Jew that all he knows is kingdom. And then this king coming is going to suffer. Who wants to follow him? It's a message of faith. It's not a message. That's why when you are preaching the kingdom of God as a place of making money, you are doing a disservice to the message. You are doing a disservice to the message. <laughs> you can't be in a hurry to want to make God look like a good boy by talking about prosperity than Jesus. Who is the king of the kingdom himself? He will have come with siren. He will have dropped from the sky and maybe hang somewhere above. Where all eyes are seeing him. And be walking in the air. I'm the king of kings. All eyes look up. And if you move your eye, you disappear. So anybody that fear, I. That's a king. But this king doesn't come like that. He comes as a baby in a manger. Manger where cows drink water. That's how he announces his arrival. <laughs> Look at the announcement of his arrival. This is counterculture. The gospel is counterculture. That's why people must believe it. It's a message that brings faith. It's not a message of sight. It's a message of faith. It's a message that you believe from the heart. I'm teaching good here. Okay. It's a message of faith. He wants to talk about the power of God and it talks about suffering. Now that word grief, he bore our grief. There is the word pain. A Hebrew word makob. Makob. M-A-K-O-B. Makob. Carried our sorrows. That word grief is in verse 4. Makob. The verb of that word is carb. It means to cause pain. Then it says in verse 5, the word bruised. He was bruised. Is the word dakar. Dakar. It means crushed. Now let's see that word crushed a little bit. Just in Isaiah. You know, Isaiah was a writer who spoke a lot in figures of speech and imageries. Don't miss that. Isaiah was a writer who spoke a lot 
in figures of speech and imagery. Bible school students, I hope you remember that now. Good. Now, look at Isaiah 3.15. Isaiah 3, verse number 15. What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts? That's a picture Isaiah is painting. That beat my people to pieces and grind the faces of the poor means you oppress them. But he painted it as an imagery. Look at Isaiah 19.10. Isaiah 19.10. And they shall be broken in the purposes thereof, all that makes looses and ponds for fish. Okay, Isaiah 53, 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. So he explains that the bruising is the offering of his soul. Suche. His person, his being, the offering of his life. In Isaiah 57, 15, Isaiah 57, 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite one. A contrite that's broken. And humble spirit. So in using the word daka, it means to debase the person. Like to strip the person of his capacity. To strip him. So what Isaiah 53 is saying is, bruised, speaking about his death, the Lord bruised him. Pay attention here. So Isaiah 53 is basically talking about salvation. 53 verse 5. Read for me again Isaiah 53 verse 5. A lot of scriptures good for your health. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. Now, look at that word healed. Is the word Rapha. Je Jehovah Rapha. Which is used for physical and spiritual things. Let's go through how Isaiah uses imageries. Isaiah 19, 20 to 22. Isaiah 19, 20 to 22. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors. And he shall send them a savior and a great one and he shall deliver them. Next verse. And the Lord shall be known to Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and shall do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. Next verse. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Imagery. Look at the word returned again. Like healed. Okay. That's an imagery. Look at Isaiah 30, 26. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. And healeth, so the healing there is restoring of relationships. Is it physical or spiritual? Spiritual. Isaiah 57, 18 and 19. Isaiah 57, 18 and 19. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. Restore comforts. Is that physical or spiritual? Huh? Spiritual. Again, he uses the word healing as restorative to put things back in shape. Did you observe that? Okay, as restorative. So Isaiah never used healing in his book for physical healing. Every healing Isaiah was speaking about was spiritual. Every healing. Isaiah 53 verse 5. Read for me. Isaiah 53 verse number 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes. The word stripe. We have seen it in the Greek. But just for reference is the word chebura. Chebura. I mean, yeah, chebura. C-H-A-B-B-U-R-A-H. Is the word wound. C-H-A-B-B-U-R-A-H. 
in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5 to 6. Read for me, Isaiah chapter 1 verse 5 to 6. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Next verse. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Is this physical or spiritual? Eh? Spiritual. So by saying the chastisement of our peace, where he used the word as shalom. Shalom. And the Hebrew, it means to amend. To amend. Something to amend. Look at Isaiah 6.10. Isaiah 6.10, where we have been quoting sins. Isaiah 6.10. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and convert, and be healed. You remember we've been reading this in the past few days? They should see and hear and I, they should be converted and I should, this is where they all got it from. So by saying the chastisement of our peace, where he used the word as shalom, you can see that Isaiah's use of sickness and disease was, was, was not national, national, was national all over the book. And he used it for a spiritual condition and for the actions of people. So when he said, no inhabitant of Zion shall say, I am sick. No inhabitant of Zion shall say, I am sick. Then you now hear that Trophinus was sick, Timothy was sick. It looks to you like a contradiction. You're laughing at the name, right? <laughs> Ungwana, you take the name, leave me with this. <laughs> Okay, what he is saying is nobody in Zion, because we are rescued, shall be found diseased spiritually. Because we've been rescued. So nobody in Zion shall be found diseased spiritually. So whilst divine healing is available in the name of Jesus, this is not the scripture for it. I have received divine healing times beyond counting my family swims in divine healing by the grace of jesus nobody in my family has slept in the hospital one night ever neither will it ever happen so we we swim in miracles the only time mama slept one night in the hospital was delivery one or two nights, and you are discharged sharp, sharp. Delivery only. Delivery only. So, you can't be saying, I don't know about healing, that's why. No, me? <laughs> healing for me is like eating a bar. When my body does, yeah, it gets healed without, too much, without notice. You must be a man that swims in divine healing to preach the way I preach all year round. True or false? If, if you, if not, try out. Take microphone and just tell stories every day. Take, just tell stories. Don't teach. Don't study. Don't, just stand and tell stories every day for one year. Let's see how healthy you are. So if it's divine healing, I believe in it. I've experienced it times after time after. I enjoy divine healing. I heal the sick. I lay hands on people. They get healed. Even in church here. Now, but this scripture is not for divine healing. The thing about Bible truth is that the moment you say something else apart from what it is saying, your worship of God is tinted. The moment you take a scripture and you say something else apart from what it is saying, your worship of God is tinted. The moment you are quoting a scripture from its original intent, the moment you are, you are quoting a scripture from its original intent, you will never see God in the light he wants to be seen. You will never see him in the light he wants to be seen. There's a light through which God wants to be seen as revealed in the scriptures. So once you abuse the meaning of scripture, you can never see God in the light he wants to be seen. 
Yeah, your, your revelation of God will be tinted. So this is not in any way to disparage the truth about divine healing. Divine healing is not from this text. Jesus did not die and rise from the dead so that our physical bodies will be healed. No. He didn't die and rise from the dead for our physical bodies to be healed. In as much as by the authority we have in the name of Jesus, we can rebuke sickness to flee and all that. But the truth is that all that happened before he died. He was healing the sick before he died. Somebody said, but he forgave sins before he died. You are not listening. You are not listening. The forgiveness of sin is beyond pardon. What he gave before death was pardon. But after resurrection, forgiveness goes far beyond pardon. I said that in this teaching, right? Yeah. But healing is healing. Before he died and after he died is the same thing. It's the same. Healing is healing. His resurrection didn't make healing more powerful. Healing is healing. Naaman the leper was healed of his leprosy. Blind but Timaeus, son of Timaeus, <laughs> was restored his sight. The man at the pool who was in superstitious worship, Jesus showed up and canceled superstition and made him whole. The man that was brought through the roof in a two by four, Jesus told him, stand up, carry the bed and mattress, leave this place. Healing was done before Jesus died. So healing is not part of redemption supply. Healing is part of God's character. His love and mercy for man. And it happens in the name of Jesus. So what is unique about the healing he did in his redemptive sacrifice is restoration of our relationship with God. Restoration of our relationship with God and a supply. That supply is what we are after in this series. You can see why in the epistle you almost will not find too many verses for divine healing. Abi. In the epistles, you won't find. Because healing before Jesus died was the children's bread. After Jesus died, it's still the children's bread. If you're a good, responsible father, bread shouldn't be missing in your house. Especially if your children like bread. It is the commonest thing that any house ought to have. Bread. Eh? Brody. <laughs> it's a Greek word. <laughs> Bishop, please, help them to understand that Greek word, Brody. <laughs> That's why if you are reading the epistles to look for healing scriptures, you almost may not find any. Okay? It's because the emphasis has to be relationship-based. The emphasis of his redemptive work has to be relationship-based. Of course, by the time you see gifts of healing in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, and you see 1 Corinthians 12, 28, he set it in the church. So you shouldn't have a problem with the fact that that is in the body of Christ. There is healing in the body of Christ. That's why there are gifts of healings in the church. But by the time you read Romans 9, 11, that scripture has been used and abused. Just like the word sound, who guy know sound, he used it in the fourth gospel for a man's physical well being be made whole for physical, but in the epistles, is strictly spiritual. Who guy know in the four gospels, physical, but in the epistles, spiritual. So you find out that that's where the emphasis is, just like praying for things, you will struggle in the epistles to find scripture. To pray for things. You will struggle. Even when you read Philippians chapter 4. Eh? Cast your cares. For he carried. Then he now say, and the peace of God. You want a job and you cast on the Lord. Then he say, and peace. Uh -uh. It's not talking provision. That scripture is talking about 
comfort in the midst of persecution. Philippians 4 is for people that are persecuted. That's why I say when you cast the care, the pain, the turbulence of the persecution, what will come after the prayer is the peace of God that passes all understanding to keep your heart and mind from the pressures coming from persecution. You almost may not find a scripture there. Most of the letters were written to churches. How many of you understand? You must sit where they sat to hear what they had. So you must go into their churches and sit in their congregation and live in their world and see why things were said to them the way they were said. Because the scriptures can never mean today what it never meant when it was first written. They were contending for the gospel. So when you hear suffering, it's not like you fall from Okada. Okada is tricycle. No, he's talking about the gospel. Romans was a church of persecution. Serious persecution. So, scriptures were written. First Corinthians, there was small enjoyment. That's why they had time to carry their father's wife. They had time to... <laughs> <laughs> there was too much enjoyment in 1st Corinthians. But by the time you come to 2nd Corinthians, persecution has entered the church in Corinth. Galatians is a book of defense. Defense. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because too much shame, too much persecution, too much blackmail was hitting the gospel of brother Paul. So Paul had to shout out, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I, I, I am not, I'm bold and proud of what I'm preaching. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's a book of defense. Ephesians, too much persecution in the church. So brother Paul told them, put on the whole armor of God. And having done all to stand, stand. So put on the breastplate of righteousness. Those are not armors for killing Satan. They are armors to encourage you to withstand pressure against the gospel. In Corinthians, you say, though we walk in the flesh, we do not walk after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Mighty through God to the pulling down. How do you pull down strongholds? By the preaching of the gospel. So there are scriptures to, 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 to fortify you against opposition and persecution in the midst of the gospel. Am I communicating at all? So those books were written to encourage churches. Colossians, the same. A church in the midst of persecution. Philippians, strictly persecution. Strictly. First and second Thessalonians. That's why I had to tell them, awake, awake. Put on your strength. We are of the day and not of the night. First and second Timothy, a book of suffering. And brother Paul was admonishing Timothy, my son. Be, be strong in the grace that is in the Lord Jesus. Be strong, Timothy. Be strong. First and second Peter, a book of too much suffering in the midst of the defense of the gospel. That's why we have the word apologetics. The word apologia, defending the gospel. It's Peter that brought it up. Because he too had to write that later in the midst of persecution. First John, persecution by false prophets. That's why John told them, anybody that comes without this doctrine, don't receive him into your house and don't wish him Godspeed. So there were a lot of things. And until you understand the setting, why they said those things, you won't be able to understand why they wrote it. So when you see the epistles, then you see that you are now growing spiritually. Because what the epistles will do is they take away your eyes from the natural to the spiritual where you really grow. The focus of the epistles are spiritual realities. That's why many pastors avoid it. They stay with David and Goliath. Gola, Gola, Devo, Devo. I'm unavailable. <laughs> I didn't say anything. I just said devo devo. <laughs> you know, I like the video, right? Yeah. I'm praying for him. He will preach the gospel. He will preach the gospel. Leave that thing. Let him gather all the crowd around first. When they like and finish, he will now, he will now start speaking in tongues. <laughs> God is a strategist. Just leave that in. Every knee will bow. Jesus will be the only thing all over the world. The center of all life. I didn't hear that. Amen. Like thunder. So, you can see how that, those books were situated. 
So when you now have problems, you really want to deal with physical things, you have to go back to the four Gospels. Mark eleven twenty four. What things soever you desire. <laughs> when you pray. You won't find it in the epistles. You have to go back. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, <laughs> be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. You will find all that in the four Gospels. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. You will find them in the four Gospels. You get to the epistles, the only prayer is James 1, 5. Any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of the giving God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, not in wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So he begins to teach that. Now, how, how, how you sustain yourself in the midst of persecution was the focus of the epistles. Because the prayer life of a believer is relationship based, never things. It's relationship based. That's the focus of prayer taught in the epistles. That the eyes of your understanding be lighted. That you may know the hope of his calling. That you may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. That you may stand complete and perfect in all of the will of God. All of those prayers are relationship based. They're not prayer for things. Deliver from wicked and unreasonable men. Pray for us that a door of all times be open. That the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified as it is with us. All those are prayers for ministry and service. How you sustain yourself in the midst of persecution. How you relate to the Father and how you relate with other believers. That's the focus of the epistles. Not how do I rise. Fasting to make it. How to sustain November to remember. September to remember. December to remember. January to January. Rhymes. So now it has become like a circle in the church. December to remember. January fasting and prayer. The Lord will do it again. When it's getting to June. Mediate thanksgiving for what the Lord is yet to do. Then when it gets to September, September to remember. If the clouds be full, they empty themselves. So if it has not happened, you have not yet filled the cloud. Bring a dangerous seed. October, increase the velocity of your seed. This year must not happen and meet you like that. November, end of year Thanksgiving. If you are not thankful, your tank will not be full. Thankful for what? All the seed we have sown, nothing has come. Just be thankful by faith. It's like a circle. Every year, that's the way the circle will just repeat. Always learning, never able to arrive. Hope continually being deferred, making the heart sick. There's a way they hold the congregation by marketing skills. They pray for enemies and they pray for protection at the end of the beginning of the year. Covenant of protection. Unbelievers don't have any covenant of protection and they are protected. You think it's your prayer that protects you? God is a good God. God is a good God. He loves man. He loves man. He is the one who keeps us. Even before you knew how to pray, he kept you. Didn't your mother told you? <laughs> Didn't your mother told you how you almost died? How you survived? Nobody can explain. God is a good God. Before you knew how to stand by faith and speak by faith, he's been taking care of you. And he has not resigned. His faithfulness. Wait first. Let's finish this teaching. Am I teaching good? Then they will drop some sin consciousness to tie you more. When you are beginning to look like you want to start finding liberty. Then they use heaven to scare you. My prayer for you. My prayer for you. Judas Iscariot was with the twelve. But he never made it. My prayer for you. That after all this, 
you make heaven at last. Heaven at last. Pray, clap your hand and shake your head and tell God, my God, my God, my father, my father, anything that would distract me on this journey to heaven, my father, my father, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why are you laughing at <laughs> Meanwhile, in those churches, what you should ask yourself at the end of the year is, how much of Christ did I know this year? How much of Christ have I increased in? How much knowledge of Christ have I grown in? That should be what you should be asking yourself. Not heaven at last. It's heaven at first. And this heaven you entered, to enjoy it will come by spiritual growth. So how much of Christ have I known? That's spiritual growth. It can be something Jesus didn't die for. That would be a marketing skill. Just to keep you coming. And keep you always hoping. And never able to arrive. Of course, miracles will happen in the midst of it. Signs and wonders will happen. And they will amplify it to keep you alive. Out of the whole big church. Five, six, seven testimonies. They will now blow it well. So that you will think you are the only one something is wrong with. Then you will work harder. You work harder. Till you're almost fainting. They say, push harder. If the clouds be full, you're falling down because you're tired. They say, even at the point of death, my yoke is easy. We give you Christ. You say Christ is not enough. You will collapse trying to make it enough. Jakalaba is enough for me. Ayada. Ayada. But notice, Isaiah's healing was based on a relationship. He just painted imageries. His shalom is an imagery of what Jesus will restore. The word, the word chastisement is the word musar. Musa, like Musa and Ar. <laughs> Musa and Ar. If you know Musa, add Ar to Musa. Musa is for punishment or instructions. But in this context, it's punishment. But look at what we have seen earlier. Isaiah 53 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53 verse number 6. Read for me. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at that word astray. Then he calls what Christ has done healing. That means he, we are brought back. This involves both the rich, the poor, the little, the great, the successful, the failures by societal standards, young and old. It has nothing to do with anything temporary. So his use of words are figures of speech. Just like when Isaiah said, the yoke shall be taken off your neck, the burden from off thy shoulder because of the anointing. Some versions were a bit mischievous. They said because you were made fat. Of course, that's the word. To be made fat and flourish. Isaiah is painting imageries. So obviously, he situated that deliverance in a person. His yoke. Because of the anointing. Now that anointing is a person. His name is Jesus. Because the reason why it's easy to read Isaiah's word is because we have the epistles. Why do you think the eunuch said, who is this man talking about? Himself? Or of some other man. Because the language was a figure of speech. So within the context of what Isaiah was discussing in Isaiah 53. Was seen. Isaiah 53 10. Isaiah 53 verse number 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now, did you see the word sin there? Now, give me 11 and 12 of Isaiah 53. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Next verse. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. 
and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and he made bare intercession. the sin of many and made intercession for the, for the transgressions there was nothing there about material prosperity at all what he was talking about there is the completeness of man the shalom there is the peace of relationship so spiritually speaking it will be restorative to god and that is why in matthew 8 you know when peter was going to interpret this text he said we are returned to the shepherd of our soul a finality so the healing cannot be something you are okay yesterday you are not okay today then tomorrow you are okay another tomorrow you are not feeling well then after you are healed no he said nobody shall say in zion I am sick. Because what you receive is eternal life. He's not talking about physical sickness. He's not talking about physical sickness. It's not an off and on healing. But because we have misapplied the text, it gives us doubt about the truthfulness and the integrity of God's word. God, how can you say nobody can say I'm sick? Me, I've been sick for the past three months. Eh, eh. The sickness is not physical. It's talking about a spiritual restoration to God, which is eternal. Nobody, after salvation, shall say I am sick. Teaching good here. But if I applied it well, it would just mean that, see, I am completely and totally healed by his stripes. That I have been restored to God forever. I am reconciled to God. It will settle a man's heart. The moment you look at those verses and place them in their proper use. is the reason why we have not been able to understand the subject of sin. Because we have been misquoting sin to be something else. This is not in any way to disparage the gift of healing again and the authority we have over sickness and disease. But that text of scripture deals squarely with transgressions. Look at Matthew 8.16, the way Matthew puts it. Matthew 8.16. Are we recovering for yesterday? Kabayada, Matthew, read for me, girl. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils, and he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. So physical healing. Why? Next verse. That it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet. Saying, yes. Himself took our infirmities and bare our sicknesses. So now, so far, we notice that Matthew equally used the word healed for sickness and spiritual things. He healed physically because it's a pointer that he will heal spiritually. His healing of people physically was a pointer that he's the one that was going to heal people spiritually. That it may be fulfilled. That is, it was done in view of the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. Now question, what Isaiah said, was it physical or spiritual? Spiritual. So Matthew is relating physical healing to this. Why will he say he bore? Did Jesus bear physical sickness on himself in the four gospels? Eh? 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 Talk to me. Did Jesus bear physical sickness in the four gospels? Eh? did he have issue of blood he didn't have issue of blood to show that he will heal issue of blood he was not blind to show that he will heal blind people so he didn't bear our sickness because sometimes preachers get over ambitious all your sickness Jesus has carried it no he didn't too. he didn't carry your sickness you are the one carrying your sickness but he gave you his name to heal it but he bore your sins and your sins was your spiritual disease and by his stripes now, you've been healed and none of you shall ever say, I am sick. Because you are permanently healed in salvation. I'm teaching good tonight. None of you, no inhabitant of Zion shall ever say that. So we need to also learn the logic of scripture. We need to learn the logic of scripture. That means Jesus healed the sick physically in view of what he will do to man's condition. And remember, everyone who quoted Isaiah 53, they were all talking about salvation. Both Paul, both Philip, both the eunuch, both Jesus himself and Peter, all of them used Isaiah 53 to talk about salvation from the things we have taught. So which means Matthew 8, 16 is physical healing. Matthew 8, 17 is salvation. It shows that sin was taken from an angle of sickness. 
And the way sickness was taught, which we shall examine, is like something is lost. Oh, you don't want to miss tomorrow's teaching. It's like something is lost. That is the way it was taught. That's why he kept using healing. Because it's like something was lost. So there has to be a cure. There has to be a restoration of something missing. That's why the word healing is used. Because in healing, you are restoring something missing. Hello? Yes. That's why healing. Because sin is human depravity. Something is missing. So it's not just pardon. It's beyond pardon. It's a healing and a restoration. Teaching good. I say teaching good. So it's seen as a condition. An absence, no doubt. Chata, if you remember, we talked about chata. When we say something is missing, obviously, what is missing in the life of a sinner is God. God is missing. So you see that sin is pitched primarily as independence from God. Sin is independence from God. That's why a newborn baby is never called a sinner. We will enter there tomorrow. We will enter there with serious exigencies. Not just teaser, ask the counselor answers. Serious exigencies. A baby cannot be called a sinner. No way. Jacolata. We will see the logic of saying, Adam sin, you sin. We will see how that logic works and the foolishness of that logic. We will debunk it completely with sound exigencies. Kibalata. Jekolata. Stand up. Let me enter, ask the counselor. Somebody blessed and I shout, I'm blessed. Turn to your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, no inhabitant of Zion shall say I am sick. Tell your neighbor, I can never be sick. Never. I am permanently healed by the stripes of Jesus. I have eternal access and eternal relationship with God Almighty. Glory. Father, thank you for revelation, knowledge growing big in this house. Eyes of understanding being enlightened. Our hearts open up. The word rising stronger and stronger in our conviction. And Lord, we rejoice that you are perfecting things about us in our minds. Causing us to walk in the full realities of redemption's provisions. So in the name of Jesus, I decree that an army of men and women are rising all over the blue marble planet who will preach this gospel without compromise. In the name of Jesus. Sick bodies be healed. Infirmities out. Sickness out. Bodies be healed and restored. In the name of Jesus. We give you praise and glory for answered prayer. In Jesus precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality.